Chapter 3, Professional Ethics Ethics has been defined as the study of moral principles and values that govern the actions and decisions of an individual or group. Ethical dilemmas often involve a mental conflict between differing moral requirements in which to obey one requirement will result in disobeying another. To resolve ethical dilemmas, you must first identify the problem and possible courses of action, then identify any constraints relating to the decision and analyze the likely effects of the possible courses of action, and then finally select the best course of action. All recognized professions, medicine, law, engineering, architecture, and theology, to name a few, have several common characteristics. The most important characteristics are a responsibility to serve the public, a complex body of knowledge, standards of admission to the profession, and a need for public confidence. CPAs have all of these. CPAs are representatives of the public including creditors, stockholders, consumers, employees, and others. They have an abundance of authoritative pronouncements that make up a complex body of knowledge. The standards for admission to the profession include the uniform CPA examination as well as education and experience requirements. The CPA has a need to retain the public confidence in order to be successful. Without public confidence, the CPA attest function serves no useful purpose. The AICPA Code of Professional Conduct adopted in 2014 provides guidance and rules for CPAs in the performance of their professional responsibilities. The code consists of principles which are goal-oriented, positively stated statements on the profession's responsibilities to the public, clients, and fellow practitioners. The principles provide the framework for the rules which are the requirements that are enforceable under the AICPA bylaws. Interpretations are issued by the AICPA Division of Professional Ethics to provide guidelines for the scope and application of the rules. Other guidance includes information such as the organization of the code, definitions, and pending revisions. This diagram shows the sections of the AICPA Code of Professional Conduct. The preface initially presents overview information on the code and then lists the principles of professional conduct and gives definitions of terms used in the code, information on non-authoritative guidance, and new revised and pending interpretations. Finally, the preface includes recent changes in the code. The code then is separated into three parts to address the relevant information for different types of AICPA members. Part 1 is for members in public practice. Part 2 is for members in business. And Part 3 is for other members. All rules apply to CPAs in public practice, but some do not apply to members in business and other CPAs that may be retired or unemployed as we will discuss later in the chapter. Because it would be impossible to enumerate all of the circumstances and relationships that may result in a situation in which there is a risk of noncompliance with the code, the code includes conceptual frameworks to address situations not directly addressed. Two conceptual frameworks are included for CPAs in public practice one for the overall code other than independence and one for independence and there is another for CPAs in business. The conceptual framework helps to evaluate threats to code compliance. When one or more circumstances or relationships are identified that create a situation that potentially might be viewed as a threat to code compliance the first step is to determine if the code directly addresses the situation, and if so, the issue is resolved. 
If the code does not directly address the situation, the CPA should evaluate whether the circumstance or relationship creates one or more threats to compliance with the code, such as those shown on this slide. If they do not, then the CPA may provide the service. If they do represent a threat, do qualitative and quantitative factors, including existing safeguards, reduce the risk of noncompliance to an acceptable level? If so, the CPA may provide the professional service. If not, then they may not. Safeguards are controls that mitigate or eliminate threats to noncompliance. There are three broad categories of safeguards. First, those created by the profession, legislation, or regulations, such as education requirements and competency requirements for professional licensure. Other safeguards may be implemented by the attest client, such as having management with suitable skills and experience to make managerial decisions. And last, safeguards may be put in place by the CPA firm, including policies and procedures for implementing professional and regulatory requirements, such as firm leadership that emphasizes the importance of complying with rules, internal policies, and procedures. After considering these safeguards, as well as the facts and circumstances, the CPA must make a final decision about whether the threat is at an acceptable level. The six broad principles of the Code of Professional Conduct include responsibilities, the public interest, integrity, objectivity and independence, due care and scope and nature of services. The rules of the AICPA Code of Professional Conduct are shown on this slide and will be discussed in more detail later in the presentation. CPA firm independence from a client is required when providing audit or other attestation services. Independence is not required for clients that a CPA firm provides no audit or other attestation services for. Independence is required both of mind, which is actual independence, and appearance. Independence of mind is a state of mind that permits the CPA to perform an attest service without being affected by influences that might compromise professional judgment, thereby allowing the individual to act with integrity and to exercise objectivity and professional skepticism. Independence in appearance requires the avoidance of circumstances that might cause a reasonable and informed third party aware of all relevant information, including safeguards applied, to reasonably conclude that the integrity, objectivity, or professional skepticism of an audit firm or member of the attest engagement team has been compromised. The AICPA conceptual framework for independence adapts the earlier framework for evaluation of threats to general code compliance to situations that involve independence. The relationship affecting independence must first be addressed by reference to the code itself. If the relationship is directly addressed but does not create a threat to impairment of independence, then there is no problem. If it does, then the auditor must follow code requirements. If the threat is not directly addressed, then the auditor must determine if qualitative and quantitative factors, including safeguards, reduce the risk to an acceptable level. If so, then independence is not impaired. If not, then independence is impaired. Examples of the broad types of threats to independence are similar to the threats to general code compliance. The examples of the threats to independence shown in this slide, though, are more indicative of the situations that a CPA in public practice conducting audits would be required to consider. The three categories of safeguards that can be used to mitigate threats to independence are the same as the safeguards for threats to general code compliance, 
But again, the examples of safeguards are specific to auditing situations encountered in independence of CPAs. Two particularly important concepts related to independence are one, individual accountant impaired independence versus firm impaired independence, and two, the nature of covered members. A public accounting firm does not necessarily lose independence with respect to an engagement when one or more of its employees or partners are not independent. In understanding CPA firm independence, it is critical to understand the concept of a covered member. In general, if a covered member's independence is impaired with respect to an attest client, the firm's independence is also impaired. A covered member is an individual, firm, or entity that is capable of influencing an attest engagement. Covered members are listed on this slide. All CPA firm partners and professional employees are under a number of restrictions relating to attest clients. Two primary requirements relate to overall investments in those clients and to employment status. First, no partner or professional employee of the CPA firm or immediate family may own more than 5% of an attest client's outstanding equity securities during the period of professional engagement. Also, no group acting together can own more than 5% or firm independence is impaired. No partner or professional employee of the CPA firm may be a director, officer, employee, promoter, trustee, etc. of a client. If a CPA was previously employed by the client, they must disassociate themselves from that client and not participate in audits of any periods during which they were employed by the client. There are additional independence requirements for covered members. Covered members cannot have any direct financial interest in a client, regardless of the amount, and no material indirect financial interest. Indirect financial interests generally involve an intermediary of some sort. For example, assume that a CPA invests in a mutual fund, which in turn owns stock in a client of that CPA. The CPA's portion of that investment in the attest client is an indirect financial interest. Covered members also cannot accept gifts from clients or management, nor give gifts to an attest client. This slide illustrates the effects of individual CPA independence relationships on the CPA firm's independence. Covered members' independence affects firm independence in all categories but financial interests of non-covered members do not affect firm independence as long as they are less than 5% of stock or other ownership interest if it is a direct interest. The independence rule generally treats the interest of CPAs and their immediate families as indistinguishable from each other. Thus, as a general rule, a covered member's immediate family members, spouse, spousal equivalents, or dependents are subject to the same independence requirements as the covered member. There are two exceptions to the general rule. A family member may be employed with the attest client if the family member is not in a position to influence the client's financial statements. More specifically, the family member must not be employed in a key position. The second exception allows, in certain instances, an immediate family member of a covered member to hold a financial interest through an employer's benefit plan. This exception does not apply to immediate families of partners or professionals on the attest engagement team or those who can influence the engagement team. There are also rules relating to close relatives such as parents, siblings, and non-dependent children and other relatives and friends as shown on the slide. Important to the effect of immediate family and close relatives on a covered member's independence is whether the relative is employed in a key position in an organization. 
A key position is one that includes primary responsibility for or influence over the contents of the financial statements. Examples of key positions are members of the board of directors, chief executive officer, president, chief financial officer, chief operating officer, general counselor, controller, and treasurer, as well as others as shown. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act includes a prohibition on certain consulting services by public company auditors. These include bookkeeping or other services related to the accounting records or financial statements, financial information systems design and implementation, appraisal, valuation, and actuarial services, internal audit outsourcing services, management functions or human resource services, investments, investment services, legal services, and expert services unrelated to auditing, and certain tax services, including tax planning for potentially abusive tax transactions and providing individual tax services to client officers who play a significant role in financial reporting. The AICPA has determined that questions may arise as to how much assistance CPAs may provide on information systems design and implementation for test clients without impairing independence. An interpretation of the Code of Professional Conduct effective in 2021 assumes that CPA compliance with other independence requirements and concludes that there are some services associated with systems design that do not impair independence, such as those relating to a system other than the financial information system or to implementation using off-the-shelf software. However, involvement in other services associated with system design for attest clients, such as those that relate to modification of commercial off-the-shelf financial information system software, or to the financial information system that the CPA designs or develops, would impair independence. This slide provides the approaches to breaches of independence by the three major standard setters. The AICPA ethical standards require the CPA firm to promptly communicate a breach to the appropriate firm personnel, ensure that appropriate action is taken to first determine that the interest or relationship that caused the breach no longer exists, and evaluate the significance of the breach. The SEC states that for an inadvertent violation to have occurred, it must have been when the covered person did not know of the circumstances giving rise to a lack of independence, and the covered person's lack of independence was corrected promptly, and the firm has a quality control system in place for providing reasonable assurance that the firm and its employees do not lack independence. The PCAOB differs somewhat from the SEC in that if a breach is identified, the CPA firm must address the underlying circumstances that resulted in the violation and determine that the violation was of such a nature that the firm was capable of exercising objective and impartial judgment and that a reasonable investor with knowledge of all relevant facts and circumstances would conclude that the firm was capable of exercising such objective and impartial judgment. The breach must also be communi communicated to the client's audit committee to make similar judgments. The integrity and objectivity rule applies to all members of the AICPA and all services provided by CPAs. An interpretation of the rule states that a CPA will be found to have knowingly misrepresented facts in violation of the integrity and objectivity rule when he or she knowingly makes or permits or directs another to make materially incorrect entries in a client's financial statements or records, fails to correct financial statements that are materially false or misleading when the member has such authority, 
or signs or permits or directs another to sign a document containing materially false or misleading information. The general standards rule applies to all CPA services and states that a member will comply with standards and interpretations relating to professional competence, due professional care, planning and supervision, and sufficient relevant data. The compliance with standards rule requires CPAs to adhere to the professional standards issued by various technical bodies, as shown on the slide, and states that CPAs must become familiar with the applicable standards issued by these technical bodies and apply them to their engagements. The Accounting Principles Rule recognizes the authority of certain designated bodies to issue generally accepted accounting principles. Under this rule, the AICPA has designated the FASB, GASB, FASAB, and IASB as such bodies. In addition, a CPA may report on financial statements prepared following principles of other organizations if the CPA's report or the financial statements make clear the financial reporting framework and do not suggest that generally accepted accounting principles were used. The Act's discreditable, discreditable rule gives the AICPA the authority to discipline those members who act in a manner damaging to the reputation of the profession. The three bulleted circumstances outlined in the Integrity and Objectivity Rule relating to misleading entries and financial statements are considered discreditable. Other rules cover client records, CPA prepared records, CPA work products, and CPA working papers, and when they should be returned or provided to the client. CPA working papers prepared solely for the engagement, whether prepared by the client or the auditors, need not be provided to the client. An accountant in public practice is prohibited by the contingent fees rule from providing services on a contingent fee basis in certain circumstances. No contingent fee engagements are allowed for services prepared for a client that also engages that public accounting firm to perform audits, reviews, certain compilations of financial statements, or examinations of prospective financial information. A CPA may not receive a contingent fee for the preparation of original or amended tax returns or claims for tax refunds. Preparation of a tax return includes giving advice on how particular items should be handled on the return. The PCAOB prohibits all tax contingent fees and prohibits auditors of public companies from accepting engagements for tax services that are determined based on the results of judicial proceedings or the findings of government agencies. CPAs who perform either audits, reviews, or compilations of financial statements or examinations of prospective financial statements cannot accept a commission from the providers of services and products for recommending services or products to a client. However, CPAs who do not perform any of these services may receive such a commission if disclosure is made to the client. For example, a CPA that does not perform any of these services may receive a commission for purchasing and selling securities for a client as long as they disclose the existence of the commissions to the client. For many years, CPAs were strictly forbidden by the AICPA rules from advertising. Now they may advertise as long as the advertising, advertising is not false, misleading, or deceptive. Acceptable advertising is that which is informative and based upon verifiable facts. This rule stresses the confidential nature of information obtained by CPAs from their clients. The nature of accountants' work makes it necessary for them to have access to their clients' most confidential financial affairs. However, this rule does not provide justification for the CPA to cooperate in any deceitful act. 
CPAs are not allowed to disclose to outside parties confidential client information without the client's specific consent. Auditors cannot disclose directly illegal acts by the client unless they have a legal duty to do so. The communications between CPAs and their clients are confidential, but they are not privileged communication such as that shared with attorneys, clergy, or physicians. As such, the CPA may be compelled to disclose their communications with clients in certain types of court proceedings. The Code of Professional Conduct allows CPAs to practice in any legal business form. This includes the ability to practice as professional corporations, limited liability partnerships or companies, partnerships, and sole proprietorships. Fictitious names are allowed as long as they are not false, misleading, or deceptive. This diagram illustrates the relatively new alternative practice structures discussed in Chapter 1. The code does allow CPA firms to form various affiliations between firms that include these structures. In addition to applying to members in practice, the AICPA Code of Professional Conduct also is applicable to members in business and other members such as those who are retired or unemployed. Members in business must comply with applicable rules for integrity and objectivity, general standards, compliance with standards, accounting principles, and acts discreditable. Other members must comply with rules relating to acts discreditable. The Institute of Internal Auditors has a code of ethics that primarily addresses internal auditors' obligations to their employers, but it also includes provisions that prescribe integrity, objectivity, confidentiality, and competency in the practice of the internal auditing profession. The rules of conduct on integrity require internal auditors to perform their work with honesty, diligence, and responsibility, observing the law, and making disclosures expected by the law and the profession. They are not to knowingly be a party to any illegal activity or engage in acts that are discreditable to the profession, and they should respect and contribute to the legitimate and ethical objectives of the organization. In order to maintain objectivity, internal auditors shall not participate in activities or have relationships or accept anything that may impair or appear to impair their unbiased assessment. And they shall disclose all material facts known to them that if not disclosed may distort the reporting of activities under review. To protect the confidentiality of their employers, internal auditors are required to be prudent in the use of and protection of information obtained in the course of their duties and not use information for any personal gain or in a manner detrimental to the legitimate and ethical objectives of the organization. Internal auditors shall engage only in those services for which they have the necessary knowledge, skills, and experience and shall perform internal auditing services in accordance with the standards for professional practice of internal auditing. They shall also continually improve their proficiency and the effectiveness and quality of their services. And this is the end of the presentation for Chapter 3.